An elite wing of the White Knights, the Temple Knights are known for their ruthless and swift judgement on anything that would threaten Asgarnia. Potentially thousands of years old, this organisation has come across its most deadly foe yet, the Sea Slugs. One of the earliest records we have of the White Knights and the Temple Knights was of their crusade. One that happened centuries ago. The White Knights, alongside the Temple Knights, had a bloody war against the being known as Mother Malum. Emerging from the seas with an army of slugs, her plan was simple. Possess the important political figures of the world and rule it through them. This crusade was bloody, with the White Knights suffering heavy casualties and losing many members not only to battle, but to Mother Malum's mind control as well. Those was possessed, she took with her to her base of operations, a large submarine fortress known as the Slug Citadel located off the coast of Ardoin. The few knights that had escaped proceeded to devise a method to remove the possession, and succeeded, eventually freeing most of their battle-scarred troops. Next, they came up with a plan. Assault the Slug Citadel, lay out Mother Malum into a cave, and magically seal her in there. The door that was used was enchanted with modified rune stones that stopped her from escaping, and with their leader gone, the rest of the Sea Slugs retreated beneath the waves, hopefully to never be seen again. Being a famous order dedicated to Saradoman and covering the lands of Asgarnia, their official HQ is the White Knight's castle in Falador. At the start of the Fifth Age, the White Knights allied with King Radolin and became the main military force in Falador. This is essentially where their influence began to grow, as when Radolin died, King Valance took his place and proceeded to rule into old age, and still rules to this day, though there is much speculation regarding his actual status. You see, the King became very ill in the year 162, and the White Knights had took advantage of this, inserting their leader, Sir Amak Vars, as the regent of Asgarnia, which gave them a massive upper hand in their conflict against the Kinshra, or the Black Knights. Following their rise to power and utilising said power to their benefit, Amak Vars declared that the Black Knights were no longer to have any political power within Asgarnia, which as you can imagine, didn't go down so well. Lord Aquarius of the Kinshra declared war against Falador, and soon after, there was a great battle in the north of Falador. The battle was a stalemate with both forces clashing endlessly, with neither getting the upper hand. Ultimately, retreating to treat their wounds and plotting how to destroy each other. Though the written history of the White Knights is brief, they are still a force to be reckoned with, having many soldiers under their control. In fact, you become one of the Temple Knights in their questline, and the Falador Achievement Diary essentially requires you to kill over 1,300 Black Knights, so you move all the way from Novice to Master. I don't want to think about how many cannonballs I used to do that, honestly. Moving on to the best of the order, being the elite force of the White Knights, they're described as being smarter, stronger, and better than the other White Knights. So just a little bit elitist. The origins of the order can be traced back to the time of the God Wars, where Saradoman himself founded the order, which was made up of his most devout followers. Surviving the God Wars, which was no easy feat, their main objective is to simply protect the Kingdom of Asgarnia, alongside the White Knight Brothers. Though the majority of their work is done in secret with only rumours and tall tales being told about them, though they do consider themselves to be the frontline defence for Asgarnia. According to certification, they don't even take orders or answer to anyone but Saradoman himself. However that works. And that's all for the history honestly, there's not that much, as a lot of the history isn't exactly clear until the Fifth Age. But let's move on to the best part when we get involved. Having four quests in total in OSRS and a few more in RS3 with an actual finale, we start with Recruitment Drive. Recruitment Drive has us approach Certification, who recruits us for the Temple Knights, and sees us complete a series of recruitment tasks and puzzles to see if we're up to standards of the Temple Knights. Starting the quest, we speak to Sir Amak Vars, who guides us to speak to Certification, before we go through a series of tests, with seven different tests in total. First, we have Sir Quam, who tells us we need to defeat Sir Lay to pass the test. The difficult part? He's been blessed by Saradoman so that no blade may harm him, and next to us are a selection of four weapons. A steel sword, a steel claw, steel battle axe, and a steel warhammer. Now we can use either the warhammer or our fist to constantly bonk him on the head until he's out cold, and we pass the test. The second test is with Sir Spicious, who gives us a classic stock puzzle, the Chicken Grain Fox puzzle. We need to carry all three of these over to the other side on a bridge that only supports 5 kilograms, and each one weighs 5 kilograms, meaning we have to do one at a time. If we leave the chicken with the grain, he'll eat the grain, and if we leave the fox with the chicken, he'll eat the chicken. But due to our massive IQ, we breeze through this. Lady Table will test our memory, 
where in front of her will stand 11 statues, so we must memorise them and once the test begins the missing 12th statue will return and we have to guess which one was the returned one. Miss Cheevers gets us to find items and open two locked doors in a massive MacGyver fashion. Sir Ren Itchud gives us a riddle to solve. Miss Hinterpret gives us multiple choice riddles. And finally, Sir Tinley needs us to stand still for eight seconds to complete this trial. And that's it. We go back to Sir Tiffy and he congratulates us. We get access to the Temple Knight Initiate armor and the ability to respawn in Falador. Picking back up in Wanted, we find out that due to an oversight during our recruitment, we aren't actually permitted to join the Temple Knights, as we needed to be a squire for five years beforehand, and I don't think that's a grind anyone wants to do. Say it if he has a plan though, exploiting a loophole to get us in officially. What do we have to do? Well, we go and speak to Amic Vars and decline his offer to become a squire. I'd say that we don't want RuneScape to be like a second job, but agility does exist. Anyway, he lets slip that there needs to be a crisis for us to become a deputy though there is no crisis at the moment. When we head back to Tiffy and bother him enough, we're informed that there is a sudden crisis, which leads to Sir Amic elaborating that a criminal named Solus Stelliger, the infamous murder mage, is back, and that due to him evading capture numerous times, it's down to us to find and kill him as a last resort. We infiltrate the Tavoli dungeon and head towards the Kinshra base, where we attempt to speak to Lord Aquarius, the current leader of the Black Knights. We utilise the tried and true tactic of murdering someone to get the Quarius to beg us to not kill any more of his men, before telling us that Solus is in a place of a lot of fair, and that the fair is not from a bear. God, I really hope it's not a convention. We bargain with a Zamorakian mage and give him 20 rune essence for him to tell us that he went east, so that means he must be in Canifus with the werewolves. Moving our investigation to the swamps of Mauritania, we scan around the town and find Solus for the first time, before he quickly teleports away. Though Savant, who's been helping us as our eye in the sky during the quest, tells us that she was able to pull some items off Solus as he escaped, which gives us a clue as to where he is. And then, we start our wild goose chase. Eventually, we do confront Solus and witness him murder 15 rangers with one ice barrage, so evidently he's been doing some bursting at maniacal monkeys. Vengeance in mind, we proceed to fight and beat him, finishing the quest and giving us access to the White Knight ranking system. Cecil has us talking to Caroline East of Ardoin, who tells us about her husband and her son who are missing and asks us to go to the fishing platform to investigate and hopefully find them. We help Holgart repair his ship before we go to the fishing platform, and once we arrive, we see how everyone is acting a little bit weird. They're all in a zombie-like trance, and we see sea slugs everywhere on the platform. Regardless, we find Bailey inside of a small room, and he tells us about the haulings of the sea slugs, and how everyone began acting weird after that. We pick up some glass and damp sticks before we find Kenneth, and he tells us how his father tried to leave a few days ago, but the fisherman stopped him, and he asks us to help him. So we do, obviously. We go back to Holgarth, and he takes us to a small island where Kent was stranded, and we rescue him. We then head back to the platform and find out that the sea slugs are afraid of heat. So we dry the damp sticks with a glass and the power of the sun, and we craft a torch to use against sea slugs and fishermen, to utilise a crane to save Kenneth and Kent. We return to Caroline and let her know the good news. A nice and short quest, teasing things a little bit bigger. Being sent onto our next mission, we learn of a city named Witchhaven, with reports of strange things going on. We're instructed to go and speak to the local agent, Colonel Jake O'Neill. Travelling to Witchhaven, we speak to O'Neill and get the lowdown of the situation. People? Acting weird. Mayor Eustace Hobb? Especially weird. Looking more sickly and working night and day to restore an ancient shrine just west of town. We also learn of the important people in town and start our investigation. We speak to all the strange acting folk and report back to O'Neill, who then tells us to investigate the shrine that the mayor is obsessed over. So we make our way there. We find a false wall and we push it open. We go through the area until we reach a door that we can't open, and Savant is unable to help us, saying how there's strange markings on the door. And before we leave, we pick up a dead sea slug off the floor and go to Jorrell's house. Jorrell translates the markings for us, and we go back to O'Neill. We'll be told to go and see the priest, and when we try, we see the mayor leaving the church. But as soon as we attempt to speak to the priest, we see that he is also now a little bit sickly, just like the mayor. We ask him about the door and he tells us about a book that could help us, but the pages are missing. Just our luck. But regardless, we find the pages, one being in the mayor's house, another given to us by Ezekiel Lovecraft, and the last one from O'Neill. But it's in pieces, and O'Neill looks a little bit sickly like all the other villagers. We use some sticky glue that we manufacture from a rendered slug to stick the pieces together, and look at the completed pages. So we go on to craft some very rudimentary ruins of different elements before we head back down to the door and open it. And funnily enough, it seems Mayor Hobb tricks us into opening the door, 
so that Mother Malum could escape. We kill a level 62 slug prince before Mother Malum stares us down, and we are quickly teleported away before we perish. Thanks, Savant. And that's all we have. That is the Temple Knight questline and the second quest of the Sea Slug quest line. So to say it was left on a little bit of a cliffhanger is an understatement. In RuneScape 3, there's one more quest regarding the Sea Slug quest line, and that's Salt in the Wound. It carries on directly after the event of the Sea Slug Menace, where we eventually take on and kill Mother Malum. Will the quest ever be backported? No. From what I found out, absolutely not. According to the RS3 wiki, when the quest was first released, it had massive flaws and plot holes. Certain NPCs not showing up, other characters acting completely different to previous quests, and it also ignored the plot set up in The Slug Menace. People weren't a fan of any of these things, and not only that, but the forced inclusion of Dungeoneering, large amounts of humour and a very dark questline, and ending in a very anticlimactic matter left a lot of people with a sour taste. Mother Malum does get killed, but a conveniently placed pillar that ends up dropping and killing her. Considering the quest was seen as a massive disappointment, Mod Ed even criticised the quest and cited it as an example of a quest that would never be backported under any circumstance. That means that whenever they get round to continuing the quest line, and we know that some people want it a little bit more than others, we'll be getting something that will be wholly original and where we take down Mother Malum. We might even get an upgraded version of the Prostolite armour, which I'm sure the Viawatch farmers wouldn't mind. Mother Malum is a villain that we've only seen once, so who knows what she's been up to for the many years of downtime. She certainly has plans and ambitions for world domination. What villain doesn't nowadays? but it'll be interesting to see how the old school team decides to move forward with this considering Salt in the Wound won't be backported. Keeping with the darker themes of the quest line, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you did, please do like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. I'm open for suggestions for content to add to an already growing list. And as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.